You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to Inside the Screenwriter's Mind, episode number seven. Screenwriting is no more complicated than old French torture chambers, I think. It's about as simple as that. James L. Brooks. Have you ever wondered what it's like inside a screenwriter's mind? In this podcast, we explore how successful screenwriters tackle structure, plot, character, dialogue, and the film business. Get ready to go down the rabbit hole of story. Let's travel inside the screenwriter's mind with your guide, Alex Ferrari. Welcome to another episode of Inside the Screenwriter's Mind. I am your guide, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is brought to you by Bulletproof Script Coverage. Now, unlike other script coverage services, Bulletproof Script Coverage actually focuses on the kind of project you are and the goals of the project you are. So we actually break it down by three categories, micro-budget, indie film market, and studio film. There's no reason to get coverage from a reader that's used to reading tentpole movies when your movie's going to be done for $100,000. And we wanted to focus on that at Bulletproof Script Coverage. Our readers have worked with Marvel Studios, CAA, WME, NBC, HBO, Disney, Scott Free, Warner Brothers, The Blacklist, and many, many more. So if you need your screenplay or TV script covered by professional readers, head on over to CoverMyScreenplay.com. And guys, I have a special treat for you. If you are interested in getting a three-part video series on screenwriting and how to write blockbusters in Hollywood today by some Oscar winners, some multi-billion dollar screenwriters. All you got to do is head over to bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash free video series. Now today we go inside the mind of Kelly Furman Craig, the writer of The Edge of Seventeen. And what's unique about Kelly is she not only got to have her first screenplay produced, but she also got to direct it and be mentored by the legendary James L. Brooks. This episode was originally broadcast on the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, and she dropped a bunch of inspiration and knowledge bombs in this episode. So prepare to go inside the mind of Kelly Freeman Craig. I'd like to welcome to the show Kelly Freeman Craig. Thank you so much, Kelly, for being on the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm 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 a big fan. I loved your movie Edge of Seventeen. It's it it, it, it harked back to uh, my my well basically our time growing up <laughs> in the uh, with John Hughes films. Yes. Oh man, thank you. That's such a great compliment because yeah, I grew up on those films and and yeah, I feel like they were especially at that age like they're so formative. You know, what man, I mean? those, he was on, films he was, that get that feeling. Um, <sighs> Yeah, he so, had he had his hand on the pulse, didn't he? <laughs> he? Yeah, he totally did. He got how like I, I think like the thing that was amazing is he just he got how um, layered it is, you know, and messy and complicated, and you know he he always pulled that off, um, which was just which was just cool. So yeah. let so let's get started. First of all, how did you get into this crazy business? I uh, man, in, in college I was. You know, I was uh, I was an English major and I was writing a bunch, but I I didn't really know I didn't know what I would do with it exactly. Um, and then I uh, I did my first internship when I was a senior in college at a at a uh, film production company and read um, my first screenplay and just kind of fell in love with um, with the medium. Luckily, the first screenplay that I read was was something really good. Um, <laughs> And so it just made me, uh, it made me want to try it. At the time I was doing, like, I was, um, I was doing, uh, like spoken word poetry, like slam poetry. Slam poetry. poetry. That yeah. must've been, a, that must've been a dark time. <laughs> like, such like a college thing to do to sure, like, you sure. know, like go to like little underground coffee shops yep. and like, you know, a moat, you know? Did <laughs> people, anyway, did, so- did people snap instead of clap? <laughs> oh yeah, totally. <laughs> It was, we took ourselves very seriously, very seriously. As you do in college. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so anyway, so I was writing, I was writing those like little characters that were, they were basically like monologues, I guess I was writing different in different voices essentially. And then when I, you know, read my first script, I was like, Oh, this is, 
you can make all these different voices talk and things happen. And there was something exciting about that. And at that time, I had just started to watch movies that I felt like um, uh, were about me at that age. Like I, I had for the first time discovered Swingers. Um, mm-hmm. And that was actually one of the films that really made me like wow. go, oh, wait a minute, this can be about like me and my friends and, and my life, you know, All movies right. can be about that. And so it made me want to just start to try to, um, you know, try to write something. Um, so, so yeah, so I started and, um, and then, uh, moved up to LA and, um, you know, was like temping and a a receptionist and an assistant and that sort of thing and writing at night and then, um, finished my first script a few years later and, uh, and then ended up selling that. And that was probably in 2004 or five. Is that, Um, is that post-grad? Yes. uh Uh-huh. Yeah. How was what was your experience as a as a as a first time basically produced writer working on a fairly decent sized budget um, uh, film and, and like that whole experience? It was it was it was wild. It was crazy <laughs> because on because on the one hand you're just you're so excited that like someone is going to make your film like this is going to happen you know right um right. and then um and then so sort of like the um just the excitement of of all that was an incredible high. But then when you actually get into it and you realize that, um, that, you know, uh, you write this thing, but it's really kind of a template and then it's, it sort of grows legs and runs away and (laughs) and it's not really yours anymore, you know? Um, so, and that, that part, that part of it was hard. It was hard to go and like, and sit down in the theater for the first time and see it and feel like, Oh my God, this is, this is so, um, not what you wrote. (laughs) Not what I, yeah, exactly. Right. It's, isn't that the, the, the trials and tribulations of every, writer in Hollywood. Exactly. And some, but I think like, you know, you sort of, at least starting out, you don't think it will happen to you. You (laughs) Oh yeah. Oh no, I'm good. I won't fall into that trap. I know the traps there. I won't fall into it. Exactly. Yeah. (laughs) And then all of a sudden you're there and you're like, holy shit, it's there. Everyone's right. That's what happens. So anyway, so, um, so, uh, but the, you know, it, it, that was a painful experience, but mm-hmm. the good part of it, the thing I think that, that was, um, that was positive that came out of it was it just number one, uh, thickened my skin, which I feel like you have to, you have to be really tough to just survive this, this mm-hmm. business anyway. So I think you need that. And I did not have that coming in. Um, I was just sort of starry eyed and like, Oh my God, <laughs> script like is this you know is it this easy you know right and, um but that yeah that was that was uh very quickly replaced by you know cynicism <laughs> <laughs> so um but anyway uh yeah so it was the good part about it was it um it toughened to be up and it also just made me you know want to direct um mm-hmm. which i which i don't know that i would have um really tried to do had I not had that experience. So for that, I'm thankful for it. So then how did, um, how did that experience help you get edge off uh, edge of 17 off the ground and how did it come together in the, in, in general? Um, I don't know that they were related at all. I really kind of like, once it was done, I was, I was, uh, once postgrad was done, I really, I mean, I really had a moment where I was like, I think I'm done. I think I'm just done with this whole deal. I think I just need to move out of the state. I just mm-hmm. need to buy something different. Cause I, um, I, I just, I thought, oh man, this is not, not what I, not what I had thought it was going to be like. And then, and then I sort of had a moment where, um, uh, God bless my manager. He was, he at the time just was like, Oh, you know, write something that you want to write. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and just, you know, don't think about anybody else. Don't just write something for you. Cause at the time I was also doing rewrites and studio work and stuff like that, which is, you know, when you're sort of a hired gun like that, it's, it's a different deal. You're writing, you're, you're, you're an auto, you're more of an auto mechanic. You're just sort of trying to help somebody else fix something that they're, you know, that they're, they're working on. And that's, and that's something, and that's something I wanted to talk about real quick. That a lot of a lot of filmmakers and screenwriters listening uh, kind of don't get. Sometimes they're like, you know, they just see like five years in between movies, and they're like, "How are they surviving?" And I'll, yes. I, I'll, yes. I'll, I'll, yeah. 
how do, how do you survive? <laughs> That's the thing. You, you know, you're doing a lot of things that, first of all, so few movies actually get made. <laughs> so you're writing a lot of things, but that never get made, never see the light of day. It's amazing how many things, you know, how small um, the percentage is that actually gets through. I feel, honestly, like it, I, somebody said, like, it's actually a small miracle to get a film made. And I think that's true. Um, mm-hmm. It's a, it's really, uh, it, it's a, it's a feat. So there, so anyway, so there was a lot of time in there where I was just sort of writing for uh, doing those type of things. And then there, and then there was sort of the moment where I kind of stopped everything and went, all right, let me just go and write something I, I really care about and just write it for me. And then that was, um, that was, that was Edge of 17. And then how did it come together? How did you get hooked up with uh, that little producer? His name's Jimmy? Oh, Jim- yeah. <laughs> I don't know if anyone's heard of him, but. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, uh, James, L- <laughs> James L. Brooks for everyone listening. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, you know, um, so I had, uh, I, he was, he was just like the guy that I, there's uh, really, and there still is nobody that I admire more mm-hmm. in the business. Like he's so, his films are so, I, I, I think on so many occasions he's made literally perfect films. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. And, <clears throat> and um, so I just have, had always worshiped him. And when, when I wrote this, um, uh, we decided to take a shot and send it to him, even though it was like, it was, you know, everybody prefaced it with, this is never going to happen. Like, just, just so you know, like, it's not going to happen, but we'll try, you know? (laughs) So I was like, I was braced for like, absolutely no way in hell. And then, and then all of a sudden I heard, wait a minute, he read it and he likes it and he wants to sit down with you. And then I was like, I mean, I can't like the week in between hearing that and sitting down with him. I like, I can't even describe to you. (laughs) Oh, I, 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 that I had, you know I mean? Oh, I'm sure. I mean, just like your stomach and knots and like rehearsing every last thing I was going to possibly say. Um, (laughs) And then, um, and then I, uh, I sat down with him and, um, and I also in my mind had decided that, you know, I really wanted to direct it. I really wanted to hold on to it. And I had decided that at some, some point down the line, once I had hopefully, you know, uh, buttered him up, (laughs) I could, (laughs) could convince him that, uh, that I, that I should do it. Um, but it turned out that in that first meeting, um, when we sat down, he said, I think, I think, you know, I think the voice is really specific to you. So I really think you're the right person to direct it. Wow. And I, I, I mean, I, I can't, I wish, I really wish like I, I had like a video of that whole meeting <laughs> just to see like, the absolute utter shock on my face. <laughs> um, so, um, so anyway, yeah. So I, uh, and then, um, it ended up that we, you know, he, he held to that and we, we went and made it a few years later. So, yeah, I wanted to ask you because a, a lot of film, a lot of screenwriters kind of don't understand the, the business side of it in the mm-hmm. sense of from the first draft to <laughs> first day of shooting. How many years was that? That was four years. So I, I preach a lot of the, the grind and, yeah, and the hustle absolutely. that you have to do and – and you have to show up every day and you have to keep pushing every day. Amen. Because you know what? The thing is, like, I think it's very easy when you see something on the Internet or something. You think a person is just like you think it's just happened overnight. <laughs> like It seems like it. Right. It's just like, oh, it's just happened. But, yeah, you, you don't see the like years and years and years of work to get it there. And the and the amount of no's that you have to turn into yeses and. You know what I mean? There's there's a whole big mountain to climb to to get there. You know, yeah. it's it's it's, fa- it's it's fascinating. Most of it, yeah, yeah, most of the job. It's fascinating that a movie like Edge of Seventeen could get made, uh, just in general, because you know, in today's world of of you, you know, know. multi blockbusters, um, that a studio could get behind a, a film like that is is awesome. But yet, yeah. also that whole that whole uh, development stage. Mm-hmm. How many projects I'm sure have you heard about from other people or been involved with that go through that development stage and just die like five years in? They're like, oh, there's a change in the studio or all oh, of it. Yeah. It just goes away and then you're just heartbroken. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. I think it's it's so many different things have to line up for it to work. And and it's also, you know, 
I think you have to um, you have to care about the film that you're making so much that you are able to withstand the 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 slog of it you know the The brutality the brutality (laughs) yeah exactly and just the you know i mean also just having to live with live with it for four years and love it still and Mm -hmm. be passionate about it still even after you've been so in it that you can't you know what i mean i mean Mm -hmm. it's like when you're in the editing process like by the time you 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 know you get to your test audience, you've seen the movie like five hundred times. So every joke, like nothing makes you laugh, nothing makes you cry. Like right. there's you don't feel a damn thing because you're just <laughs> you're desensitized because you've spent so much time with it, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and you somehow I think have to be able to get through that and and reset and reset and constantly somehow like freshen yourself to experience it emotionally new over and over and over again. And that also I think is something people don't really talk about as part of the process. You have to like be able to show up and feel it again and again and again and again, you know? Yeah. You know, you get null to it. You get dull. It, it just it, you, it nullifies your feelings towards it. Cause you know, I mean, I've been editing for 20 years and sometimes when you're on a project and you edit a feature again and again, like you oh, forget okay. the jokes, what made you laugh three months ago. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't make you laugh now. Now it just, yeah, now it just makes you want to like, you know, bang your head against the wall and, you know, like it's, yeah, it's, it's really, it's a, uh, yeah, it's a, the, part of it is really exactly what you said. It's, it's the grind of it. It's hard. Yeah. Now, what was it like working closely with James uh, Ellis Brooks? I mean, he's obviously a legend in the industry. What was it like working with a legend? You know, what's amazing to me is that, you know, sometimes you meet your, you meet your heroes, you meet those legends and you're like, Oh, he's just, you know, a mortal man. He's, you know, like, <laughs> yes. But with Jim, I swear to God, it's like the closer I got to him, the more I just was enamored and blown away by his, his genius. Like he's, he's literally, he's a genius. Mm -hmm. He's, he's also like, I've never seen anybody who has a more lightning fast mind. That's the other thing. Like he's, he is able to, um, he's able to articulate things so beautifully and poetically and, and hilarious and in the most hilarious way imaginable and off the top of his head in like a half a second. And I don't, there's so few people on earth that can do that, Mm -hmm. you know, and he can also distill something down to its essence in a second and a half. And he's, I mean, I, I just, I feel like I'm, I, it's, I only am more, um, I only worship him more. I'm only more in awe of him. Um, I feel so lucky that I got to be in, in the presence of that, you know? If you had one lesson to take away from working with Jim, uh, and I call him Jim now because I know him, obviously, but um, <laughs> if, if from from working with uh, Mr. Brooks, uh, what would be that one lesson? Be the like, oh my God, this is that nugget of that that gold nugget of information that I just is invaluable. Um, uh, two two things actually. The first thing was, and this totally changed my life, really, really, really. Mm-hmm. Um, he said when we first sat down. Um, and we're starting the development process. He said, the most important thing you have to figure out is what do you, what are you saying about life in this story? And I, I thought that was, that's, it's so important because there, there's so often you can get caught up in the mechanics of storytelling and jokes Mm -hmm. and, you know, and everything. But at the end of the day, a, a film needs a thesis it needs to say something about how we live, you know, mm-hmm, it needs mm-hmm. to say something about our experience as humans. And, um, and it's amazing. I think actually how, um, infrequently that question is actually asked when, uh, you know, when, when people are making a film and I know, I don't know that I was asking myself that question before I worked with him. And now I'll, I'll never, I never approach a, a film, um, 
you know, as I'm looking at, as, at new projects and starting new things, that's always the first question on my mind to the point where I'm probably annoying everybody because <laughs> I'm like, but what is it saying? You know, <laughs> so about, what does it mean? What is the meaning of life in this yeah, story? <laughs> exactly. I, I mean, that's really, a, but when you think about it, like when you really think about your favorite movies, you can, you can yes. do that. You can mm-hmm. say it's saying this, it's a, it's really about this. Like there's something that you take away. And, um, so that was a really, um, that was life altering, honestly. And, um, and then the other thing was he really, he encouraged me to go spend some time with teenagers, just re- research it, spend time with the people because mm-hmm. there's something about that, that, um, first of all, there's, it, the, they give you little details and insights that you can't, you can't just make up. Um, and they also, it's suddenly you have a face for, um, it's, 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 it's like you have a little constituency or something. (laughs) Right. It's, it's just, it gives you a different, um, I don't know, a different level of, um, mission or something. Uh, cause you're like, Oh man, but these are the people really actually living this. So how can I try to really capture that in a way that they would go? That's it. That's mm-hmm. the feeling, you know, to honor them. Yeah, exactly. And their yeah. struggle. Cause it is not easy being a teenager. It is, it is not easy. I cannot even imagine being a teenager today with oh, all this. Oh God. I got, you know, what is, you know, what's so amazing too. Like the other day I, uh, driving along and um i was driving along with my husband and i heard a song from um from the 90s when i was a teenager mm-hmm. and i was and it just like it did that thing where it just mm-hmm. like hit me like a, like a <laughs> ton of bricks and it, i was just my stomach was in not <laughs> i was like holy like i was like i was back there immediately yes. and i was it was whoa i mean it's it's it was a amazingly powerful time in life. Oh, the, so I'm happy to be past it too. Yeah, <laughs> it's no, no. I mean, but just the brutality of social media and teenagers, I cannot even imagine. Oh Can you, oh. oh God. Yeah. Now it's, now it's so much, it's gotta be, it's, it's gotta be worse. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's with, without question. It's worse. We were you know, growing up. It was just much more innocent even for us. And then, yeah, yeah. yeah. You will. And that's the thing. Like you could kind of get away from it for a second. You yeah. know, you were in this like fishbowl at school, but then you could go home and kind of like forget. But now it's just, everybody's in a fishbowl seven. all the time. Mm-hmm. You can see what everybody's doing all the time and compare yourself to it and wonder if you're, you know, <laughs> how you're you're always i think in this like weird like comparison of where you are on the social spectrum and how you're doing in life and that is <sighs> absolutely like i think maybe the most crazy making like biggest mind fuck there is <laughs> that age you know yeah it's right also yeah like who are you and where are you like where do you rank in the social hierarchy but as you and i both know it means absolutely nothing all the problems that you see in high school in the grand scheme of things, is a blip on your. Oh, yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, it just feels like the end of the world when you're there. Yeah. Oh God! Oh, no, I, I didn't get it. I didn't get that A. I didn't get that B. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah. Uh, so now you worked with some fairly popular and legendary uh, actors as well, uh, and you were a first-time director. So mm-hmm. how was it? Like, how do you direct Woody Harrelson and Kedra Cedric? Uh, Cedric, uh, Cedric? Oh man, you know, so this is also a credit to Jim. Um, when we, when, when, when I was gearing up to, um, to go into production, um, Jim said, okay, the thing we've got to do is we've got to go sit in the back of Larry Moss's class. Now, Larry Moss is a, he's a very famous acting coach. He's, he's, you know, he's, he's coached like Leonardo DiCaprio and Mm -hmm. he coached Helen Hunt and as good as it gets. And, Mm -hmm. um, and he, he puts up these, um, these classes where essentially like actors go and they, they put up a little, they put up a a scene from a movie or a play and, and then he directs them and you see something just bomb. (laughs) And then you see him give these adjustments where all of a sudden the scene just, like just burst to life. It's amazing. It's amazing to watch the transformation. Um, so sitting 
and watching like a master do that. And, you know, and really watching him for hours, mm-hmm. honestly, that was, that gave me, I, I, I had something to shoot for. I had something to go, okay, that's the thing to be after. Um, and I think, and, uh, and that helped me tremendously um, because I think had I not had that experience, um, I, I think I probably would have gone into, um, gone into the, gone into production, not necessarily a little bit rudderless, not knowing what the thing to shoot for is, mm-hmm. you know, not knowing what good directing really looks like, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, um, so honestly, I think that, that helped tremendously. I mean, no matter what, it's still Woody Harrelson. And I mean, you know, I mean, when the first time I met him, it's like, it's terrifying, you know, <laughs> yeah. like, Woody Harrelson, you know, um, but he is also such a just cool, warm, wonderful person that he, he helps that melt away really easily. And he's also somebody who's really committed to the work, doing great work, you know? So mm-hmm. that makes it easier because everybody's sort of wanting to do the same thing. Um, so, yeah. He, kept, he keeps kind of like he, he keeps the um, – he puts the bar high. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, um, do you have any tips on how – like how do you actually adjust, you know, a, a movie star as opposed to, you know – is there a difference or is there, are they just actors when they're on set with you? And I know that's kind of a weird comment, but do you know what I mean? So sometimes there is that baggage of a, of a movie star as opposed to just an actor trying to get a scene with a director. Uh, do you talk to them beforehand? Because I, I, I had another director on, on – first-time director on and he had a movie – he did a movie with John Malkovich. And okay. he actually asked John Malkovich, how do you want to be directed? Because it's John Malkovich. I mean seriously. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What a great question. Yeah. How do you want to be directed? Because, you know, I'm not going to sit here and give you motivation. That's why I hired you. You are Woody Harrelson. So, like, are there any techniques or tips that you can kind of throw at us? Um, you know, I, I, I really always try to do it as, as a, um, as playing and trying things, you know, Mm -hmm. an exploration. Mm -hmm. So my approach is it's never like, I'm never like, you did that wrong. Can you do it this way? This is the right way. I'm, I'm, everything is like, Hey, let's, um, can we try one where we do blah, blah? Um, let's try this, this time. Let's try that. Let's try, let's try these different things Mm -hmm. because that to, that to me, at least if if I'm imagining myself in an actor's shoes, that's an exploration. That's Mm -hmm. not, you know, you're messing up. Could you do it? Could you do it right? You know what I mean? (laughs) Not the not the Kubrick way, (laughs) which which is um, which also, by the way, you don't know you 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 really. The other thing that I think is so important when you're directing is like is getting choices, and that's another thing that that Jim drilled into me. It was just like get you know get what you um, you know what you had in mind as a writer, but then get a lot of different iterations of it because you when you're in the editing room, you're going to want to be able to move the scene along a spectrum and not just be stuck in, you know, because you have five takes that are angry, you know what I mean? Like if you have versions of a line, then all of a sudden you can actually have the tools to shape a scene in in the edit, you know, Uh, otherwise you have many less tools. Um, so, so that's also helpful because it just becomes the, the, um, direction really just becomes about trying things, you know, and choices and let's get one like this and let's, you know, so we have options. Um, and I think that also, that just, that eases everything off, um, that eases the pressure off and also gives, um, I think the actors permission for them to try things. That's the other thing I want that I, like, I never give direction in the beginning, um, of a scene, like, you know, we'll go over the blocking, but I tried never to, you know, I tried never to say anything because, I loved what they would come out with, you know, mm-hmm. I loved watching, Oh, that's their interpretation of that. And sometimes it's, it's much better than what I had imagined. So, mm-hmm. um, so it's nice to just let everybody, um, explore and, and play, y- play. Yeah. I mean, we're making a movie for God's sakes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, how much improv was there on set? Um, uh, it, it depended on the actors. Um, uh, Hayden Zito, who plays um, Irwin, uh, he's just, he's such a wonderful improviser. So 
Uh, and so, I mean, really everybody was. Haley is a wonderful improviser mm-hmm. as well. And would I, I really, you know, everybody on there was. Um, but I would say probably with, with Hayden, um, it was just really fun to let him riff, mm-hmm. like do his nervous riff because mm-hmm. they would just, they were so endearing that if I just let the camera roll or I just say, okay, you know, just try, try something, try something um, try whatever you want to do. Like, let's shake it up. After after I had this scene, letting him kind of just play um, really, really resulted in I think some great little moments that are that are in the that are in the movie that wound up in the movie. Um, you know, when he yells off the, uh, the Ferris wheel, yes, <laughs> we get off a fucking ride. That's that's, <laughs> his impro- that's him improvising. Um, so. You know, um, so and there's so and her laughing is her genuinely laughing because you know. But anyway, so But that's um, the best, but that's that's perfect because they're not acting anymore. They're- exactly. Yes, exactly. So like so I, to me like, to give everybody a lot of room to just try stuff and play is I I found um was really the 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 best way to do it. Um or for me the, the um I don't I I found just it allowed everybody to use their talents to the, you know, to the best of their, use the best of their talents. Of course. Now I, I'm just curious because you were talking about, uh, you said the word camera. Uh, what did you shoot this on? Cause it looked gorgeous. Oh, thank you. It was a uh, Alexa. That's what I thought. <laughs> yeah, it, it looks, it looks very, very pretty. Oh, thank you. <laughs> now, um, do you think writing is a good doorway into getting into a directing job? You know, I I have to say I don't know how anybody gets into directing without writing, but maybe <laughs> only because that's my own process. But I um I absolutely think that that's a great way to get into it because if you write a piece of material that that people like, uh, the great thing is that you can have le- you know you have leverage because it's yours, and you know you can more easily say well. I, but I'd like to direct it, you know, and that's, you know, it's a, everybody has a hard time taking on a first time director. Um, it's nerve wracking for everybody. But, um, but I think if you, if you've written the material, then you automatically have, you're automatically closer to it. You have more of, it, of an intimacy with the characters and everything else. So you can make a good argument why you're the right person to, to do it. You kind know? of the Frank Darabont way of going about things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know. I mean, I'm assuming you know that story, right? I, the, I don't tell me. The, so, so obviously, you know who Frank Darabont is, yes, uh, right. and and Shawshank. They offered him uh, high seven figures uh-huh. for Shawshank, as they okay. should, because it's arguably one of the best movies yeah. ever made. Um, and he said, "Nope, I have to direct." So he ended up with two hundred fifty thousand dollars for the script. And then he got to direct. And I, and best best decision ever. Best he's like, I'm gonna be a director. And this is what this is how I'm gonna roll. And yeah. God God bless him. He turned down the money, but in the long run, it was a great investment in himself. That's right. Uh, yes, exactly. And arguably turned out one of the greatest movies ever made. <laughs> yes, ex- yeah. Yeah, exactly. Now, um, uh, what are some of your writing and directing influences? Um, uh, Jim Brooks, obviously, um, mm-hmm. Cameron Crowe, Alexander Payne, mm-hmm. um, uh, um, I, gosh, I mean, I, Mr. Yeah, Hughes, Mr. Hughes. Uh, yeah, <laughs> for sure. John Hughes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, um, oh, um, uh, Richard Linklater. I uh. love, I love, um, before suns or before sunrise. Oh, that whole that whole that whole series is so beautiful. That whole series is so good. And they it's just so- wrote it with the he wrote it with the actors. I mean, it's yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. I love. I'm so. I mean, there are certain filmmakers that I'm just so. Um, I'm I, like so thankful for them. You know what I mean? I'm so. <laughs> thankful. I feel like every film is just um, a gift. You know, I, I'm. Mm-hmm. I'm. I don't know. So. Um, so yeah, those um, those are some of the guys. Big influences. Yeah. Now, what is the biggest lesson you took away from making Edge of Seventeen? Um, man, it was you know it was there were so many because 
it, it's just it's a steep learning curve as a first time director. So it's just mm-hmm. every single day you're learning something new. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, but uh, I think I think ultimately that um, I, you know you're you're no the thing that I that that Jim said a lot and that and that always that really stayed with me too is that you know when you're on set the thing that you're the thing that matters most is what ends up on film you know and because there are a lot of things it's um it's you know first of all it's a whole sort of army of people and there's <laughs> different fires to put out and mm-hmm. everything you know um, that's just the nature of it. Anytime you're going to do anything like this, that's the nature of it. But if you can just clear all of that away and silence that noise and just worry about what's on film and, and sometimes even if that means, you know, there are some, there were some things where, you know, we had to go 20 takes and it was, be, but you, you have to, because it's, you, you just have to, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, and when and when it's happening, it's you're sweating bullets because you can feel everybody being like, "Are you kidding me? Take 20? You know. Now, out of curiosity, on that that specific scenario, like, what was the purpose? Were you just not getting what you wanted, or were you just exploring a lot? Uh, you know, it, well, in this particular instance, that I'm thinking of it was like there was a whole, there was a bunch of extras, there was, mm. and, and it was, uh, it was just having to get, um having to get a very specific moment um, between the actors and having the extras doing the right thing at the right time and having the camera move in the right way and capture it mm-hmm. at the right, you know, it was just a lot of moving parts. And so it, it, it just took a lot to get there. It was hurting. Um, it was hurting wet cats. <laughs> right. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so, and, but there are certain things where you go, but it's, but it's important. We, we have to do it even when, you know, even when everybody's tired and it's, you know, it's mm-hmm. 4 a.m. And, you know, like you just have to know that you don't want to be in the editing room later, just kicking yourself because you didn't you didn't go one more and just get it, you know. Mm-hmm. So that that part's I think I just remembering that and somehow shutting out, you know, the noise is, I think, important. Now, what advice would you give a filmmaker who is wanting to make their first feature film? Um, oh man. Um, I, I'd probably pass along that Jim Brooks advice about get choices, you Mm -hmm. know? Um, um, uh, so that they have room to play in the edit. Um, and, um, and also to sit down with everybody you possibly can to get advice and ask where are the landmines? You know, I, I tried to do that before, before I started and people, you know, I sat down with, a number of directors that were just, were really gracious about it. And we're like, okay, you know, this, you know, this may happen, this may happen, this may happen. I suggest this. I said, like, get every bit of advice you possibly can. Um, mm-hmm. um, yeah. People who've been down the road a bit and, and, and can warn you about the, uh, the landmines. <laughs> yeah. Because a lot of, because the problem is, and I, you know, going into, going into my first thing, I knew that there were the things I know, I, I knew I didn't know. But the much scarier things were the things I didn't even know. I didn't. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, and I do. <laughs> there was a big, you know, that, that was a, there was a big section of that, you know, and um, so I was trying to shrink that box as much as I could before I went into it. Yes, I, yes, I know, I, I know that very well. Yeah. Now, what is now? What this is? This is my Oprah question. So prepare yourself. Okay. Um, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Ooh, that is a good question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I feel like I need to like lay down on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> tell me, Ke- tell me, Kelly, how were you when you were a child? No, I'm joking. <laughs> um. Oh man. Um. Mm, that is it. What it uh, um. Oh God, that is a. I'm really. I'm like so. Just something. Here. Just something I, that comes to your head is fine. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think you know. I I think. 
I think probably um, finding if, okay, I'm going to try to figure out how to articulate this, but okay. for me, it was, it was and is always important, especially as a, you know, as a person trying to tell stories to find that, um, that part that actually hurts, mm -hmm. you know, like whether I'm watching actors or, you know, like watching a take or writing a scene to find that thing that actually makes me go, Oh, Oh my God. I know that I feel that. Um, and I, I think like in a way, um, like if I can boil it down, it's probably just about like, um, compassion, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that the whole experience of the movie and looking at every different character and writing each character and, watching the takes and working with the actors is all about sort of finding compassion for each different, um, each, each, each different person and moment. And so I, th I, I guess that's, that's what I take into the, into the fu into future projects, sort of trying to find that in each character and story. And, and I guess that kind of leads over into life, you know, everybody you meet, even if the, when somebody's an asshole, if you can sort of reach past it and find, um, find the, the like pain that it's coming from you the, tr know? the truth, the truth, yeah, the truth, the truth, yeah, the truth exactly. of that person or that character. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, see, that was a, a very deep answer. <laughs> <laughs> you can get off the couch now. Um, <laughs> now this question might be even tougher. So, and this is a, uh, I asked all my, all my guests this question. Um, what are the three of your favorite films of all time? <laughs> oh man. Um, any three that come to your mind? Uh, you know, yeah, this is always so, it's so hard to do, to think, to narrow it down. But I would say, um, uh, Sideways is one of my yep. favorite films by Alexander mm -hmm. Payne. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, As Good As It Gets. Oh, it's such a good movie. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's yeah. so brilliant. Oh. It's so, it's so brilliant. It's so brilliant. Um, and, uh, and I'd say the Breakfast Club. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah I think those, there, those. there, there was rumors that they were going to make a sequel to the Breakfast Club. Oh God! <laughs> that they were going to get, they were going to go to their high school reunion, and then they were all going to get locked up in jail for something that happened, and it was just going to be them in jail. I'm oh, like, man. when was that? When that was when? John. John was still alive back then. Oh, okay. okay. John was, yeah, yeah. John was still alive Did back he then. Squash that, or was he part of that? I don't know. I don't know. I don't. I don't remember if that was. I think he squashed it. But um, there was a there was a, there was a story floating around about hey let's do a, let's do a ten year later a twenty year later, you know high school reunion of what happened to these characters which arguably I kind of been interested to know what happened you know, right it's like I don't know whether I want that or whether I am like no 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 like I don't want that I really I'm like almost equally conflicted like I'm, I'm, I equally want and don't want it you know? I, I I would want to see it personally but I don't want anybody else to ever see it again <laughs> yes yeah exactly <laughs> if that makes any sense like I'm curious to see what happened but I don't want it out there <laughs> yes yeah yeah now where can uh, people find you online uh I am I I'm on um Instagram um and I'm on Twitter. I think uh, Kay Freeman Craig on Twitter and Kelly Freeman Craig on Instagram. I'm not, I, I'm, I'm not super active on those things, but, um, mm -hmm. but, but I'm on there. <laughs> okay. Kelly, yeah. thank you so much for taking the time out to talk to the, to the Indie Film Hustle tribe and, and share your, uh, your, your journey uh, of making Edge of 17. And thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I really uh, appreciate you having me. I hope you enjoyed going inside the mind of Kelly Freeman Craig. If you want to get links to anything we spoke about in this episode, please head over to the show notes at bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash ISM007. And if you like the show, please subscribe and leave us a review on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, Spreaker, wherever you listen to the show. Head over to screenwritersmind.com. Thank you for listening. And as always, write. Rewrite, sell, repeat. I'll talk to you next week. Thank you for listening to Inside the Screenwriter's Mind with Alex Ferrari at ScreenwritersMind.com. And for more great filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com.